your science magazine of the air. Your science magazine of the air presents another interesting story from the human adventure. Today, a measurement of human intelligence. What is intelligence? How is it measured? How smart are you? How gifted are your children? These questions are not to be answered by school grades or college degrees, by bright shining eyes or high domed skulls. Science can measure your intelligence, test it and rate it, and tell you your intelligence quotient, your personal IQ, which fits you as individually as your shoe, your hat, your collar. The story behind the IQ, the story of the scientist who first devised the tool to probe the secrets of human intelligence, is today's human adventure. Of all the riddles of the nature of man, none is so mysterious and challenging as the human mind. It is the mind of man which has led him to conquer the forces of nature and to build civilizations. It is the intelligence of man that has made him master of the world. What is intelligence? How can science measure it, define it, and test it? The first clue to the answers to these questions began in France in the year 1899. The date is December 31st, the hour, midnight, and Paris is gay indeed this last night of the old year. The revelers move down a street before the home of a modest university professor, Professor Alfred Benet of the Sorbonne. Their noses pressed against a closed window above the street, Benet's two small daughters, Marguerite and Armand, look down and chanted. Look, look, Marguerite. I'm sure I shall stay awake the whole night dreaming about it. But Armand... How shall you be able to dream if, when you are awake? Tell me that. A very practical question, my pity. But I have an even more practical one. How are two little girls going to grow up to be strong and beautiful unless they go to bed at night? Oh, oh no, Papa. Papa. Please, not yet. Children, <laughs> children, it is so late. But Papa said we could stay up because he wanted to observe our reactions as one of his cats. <laughs> <laughs> you see, Brisson, what enthusiastic collaborators I have. <laughs> and I am thinking that it isn't a love for science that makes our little girls so eager, but a clever little plot to delay good night. Now, Miss Enfant, a kiss for Papa, a curtsy for Monsieur Bisson. Good night, Monsieur Bisson. Good night, Papa. Good night, my dears. Hello. Marguerite. Quickly now. Come, oh, lovely children. Such charming manners. They're growing up beautifully, Binet. It is Madame Binet who helps them to grow. I simply watch the process of two different little girls. Well, all children differ, Monsieur Binet. But why? Why should they differ? What makes them differ? When uh, there are the same parents, same training, same environment, yet different responses in walking, speaking, learning. Well, different personality types, perhaps. But surely, except what causes personality differences. Well, intelligence varies. Perhaps intelligence is a definite clue to the personality differences. It may be, my dear Brisson. We do not know what intelligence is. That is what I am trying to find out. What is intelligence? <laughs> See the problem to recognize the challenge. That is the first great step that Alfred Binet takes in the trackless wilderness that is the human mind. The human mind. How can a scientist examine its intelligence? Intelligence cannot be seen, nor touched, nor placed under a microscope. But to Alfred Binet, the vital clue comes prosaically from a practical request by a practical man of affairs. This way, if you please, Professor Binet. The Minister of Public Instruction will see you now. Thank you. Right in here. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, come right in, Professor. Come right in. How do you do, Monsieur? Ah, it's good to see you, Professor. We've been having a devil of a time. Think you can be of some help to us? Be very kind of you to call us. Uh, not at all. Here, yeah, have a cigar. Sit back, relax. I'll outline our problem for you. The problem, as outlined by the French Minister of Public Instruction, is a delicate and distressing problem even today. I am the victim of the law. I am required to remove feeble-minded children from the schoolrooms of Paris. Feeble-minded. Who knows who is feeble and who is not? Can I slice off the top of their heads? And if I did, 
What would I find? <laughs> I understand, Monsieur le Minister. There are other difficulties, Professor Binet. Uh, matters of um, grave delicacy are involved. Matters, too, of professional collaboration. Not always the easiest kind of collaboration, you are aware. I am well aware, so... Uh, so I am asking you to be a member of a commission of teachers, physicians, and psychologists to fix upon a way of distinguishing the subnormal from the normal children. Uh, the extreme cases, of course, are easily distinguished. But where is the borderline? Here you may help. There you have it. Your decision, monsieur. If I accept, I am to have full freedom? Oh, yes, monsieur. Full freedom and full responsibility for your report to me. Well? I accept. Good. I congratulate you, Professor. Uh, thank you, but I shall need your good wishes somewhat later. I warn you, my approach will be a purely psychological approach. It will not be well received by certain of my colleagues in medicine and teaching. <laughs> Alfred Binet's first attempts to work out some measurement of intelligence of backward children are very coldly received. He works with teachers and physicians. They resent his intrusion upon what they consider their special field. And I say, and I repeat, the boy is simply a little backward. A little special attention will, re will remedy his deficiencies in schoolwork. The boy has had special attention, Mademoiselle Dumont. He has not been helped. The boy needs fresh air, exercise, a tonic. It's easy to see. The boy is, well, mentally lethargic. You know how boys of his age are. I do not know, monsieur, how boys of his age are. I do not know what is this thing called backwardness or mental lethargy. Come to the point, monsieur. What is the point you wish to make? My point is we need to describe exactly, to diagnose exactly the degree and nature of intellectual deficiency before we are able to say what to do with this or any other child. But this is fantastic, monsieur Binet. First you say this child, then you say any other child. Would you test normal children also? Thank you, doctor. Thank you. That is it exactly. Hmm? What if I... Excellent, Doctor. You have given me the answer for which I have been searching. How can science examine intelligence if intelligence cannot be seen or touched? By tests, Doctor, by tests. The human mind controls the human tongue. We shall talk with the children. We shall test them through language. Monsieur Binet, this is not teaching. Professor Binet, this is a most interesting theory. I assure you, however, it is not medicine. Perhaps you are right. It may not be teaching. It may not be medicine. It seems to me, however, it may be science. And science it is. Of all the reports submitted, Benet's is the only report indicating a fresh field for research, attacking the problem from a fresh point of view. Monsieur Benet, may I congratulate you on your triumph? Dr. Simon, mm -hmm. my triumph is physical, not psychological. Everyone at the meeting was hungry and wanted to get home to dinner. So <laughs> let that fool Alfred Binet give his food test to foolish school children. <laughs> that is the nature of my triumph, my friend. <laughs> but look, Binet, you have the chance now to show them that they are the fools. I earnestly hope so. It would be a great incentive in my work to devise a test to show how abysmally stupid are some of my eminent colleagues. And I should deem it a privilege to help you, Binet. Having been a student of yours, I should prove useful before very long. After all, I'm already indoctrinated with your methods and uh, prejudices. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you are an important doctor now, and head of a hospital. Surely you are too busy. Yes, I am busy, but I get nowhere. We try to help the feeble-minded children at the hospital, but we're working in the dark. Perhaps with my hospital cases and your school observations, we can collaborate successfully. Say no more. This is indeed a heartening finish to a most disheartening day. Simon, we'll do it. We'll work together. We'll set up an experimental laboratory. Cases from your hospital, cases from my schools. And we'll find a way to measure feeble-mindedness, not simply label it. <laughs> And so begins the search into the human mind. The key is the human tongue. But what questions shall be asked? They must have a purpose, a point. Idle talk is worthless science. Hundreds of children, thousands of questions, years of testing, and Binet and Simon begin to bring their picture of human intelligence into focus. Seated at a low table in surroundings designed to put a child at ease, 
Young Pierre answers a series of questions by Professor Simon as Alfred Benet looks on. <laughs> ah, that was an easy answer, Pierre. Let's see what we can do with this one. Tell me, Pierre, what is a fork? Uh, a fork it is to eat with. What is a table? A table it is to eat on. And what is a chair? A chair it is for us to sit on. What is a horse, Pierre? A horse is to sit on, too. But a horse runs. Good boy. Very good. Tell me what a mama is. A mama is to take care of little children. And she is the kid. <laughs> now, Pierre, I'm going to place some coins on the table. And Looking on, studying, observing, Benet finds that children up to six years old define things only in terms of use. A fork is that you eat with. Not until the ninth year do children use generalized and more precise expressions, such as... A fork is something that you use at the table to pick up certain kinds of food with. Another type of question considered valuable by Binet is the comparison test. For this, he feels, does not depend upon instruction and brings into play the natural good sense of the subject. Have you ever seen butterflies, Pierre? Do you know what they are? Yes, monsieur. And flies? you know them also? Yes, monsieur. Are they alike, a fly and a butterfly? No, monsieur. Tell me in what way they are not alike, Pierre. A butterfly is, is larger and all I know. It is that butterflies fly on flowers and flies fly on the food we eat. <laughs> Simon, we have done the job for the commission. We have devised a test for separating dull children from normal children. But our job can be bigger than that. But how, Benet? Would you test all levels of intelligence? I mean, from the idiot to the genius, by tests such as these? Why not? We have our technique. We need simply to refine it. We can find out what norms of intelligence are. You mean to have a test of intelligence that would be like uh, climbing a ladder? Very good, Simon. So it would. We should find those things a normal child, say, five, ought to know. More things for a child of six, than seven, than eight, and so on. These are rungs on the ladder, so to speak. Rungs for the mental ages of each group. Then we take children, say, a child of seven. He climbs our mental ladder. Questions for the six-year-old, he answers. Then seven, these he answers. He is normal. Then eight and nine, he is somewhat superior. Then ten, no. Questions in the ten-year range, he cannot answer. Voila. At last, we know where the child's intelligence stands. Mentally, he is nine years old. And knowing his actual age to be seven, we may say also that he is two years advanced for his age. That's it. If we can devise such an exact yardstick to express intelligence in standard, definite, meaningful terms. To express intelligence in standard, definite, meaningful terms. Alfred Benet hits upon the idea of age standards or norms. That is a method to reveal mental ability according to established averages for various ages, the foundation of the concept of mental age. As a practical tool, it is one of the most important discoveries in the history of psychology. Benet is now ready to propose cautiously, tentatively, provisionally, his three-part definition of general intelligence. Listen. This is Benet's definition of intelligence. You are intelligent to the degree that you are able to do three things when facing your tasks, your problems. The test of your intelligence is your ability... One, to fix your attention upon the problem at hand. Two, to direct your thinking toward a desired end. Three, to evaluate, analyze, weigh, and judge between possible solutions or courses of action. Now the year is 1908. The work of exploration and discovery into the realm of the human mind has gone farther than any scientists have ever ventured before. And yet the brilliant Alfred Binet and the patient Théophile Simon review their labors. Oh, my mind and body. What a task. Attention, direction, judgment. What things to test. A great field, my friend. And with what poor tools we must work. No, no, not poor, Alfred. The best tools there are so far. These last scales are very fine. The learned reviews say so. Everyone says so. Everyone? <laughs> Everyone but Binet and Simon. <laughs> we know better. We know our scale is limited. That it still does not test attention, direction, judgment, as well as these must be tested. Moreover, the scale is too easy at the lower levels, too difficult at the upper levels, and besides... I beg of you, my friend, 
Do not drive yourself so. We, too, are limited. We can do only so much. We can do another revision, Simon. We can. We must. Working more intensively than ever, Alfred Binet and his assistant begin still another revision of their scale, 198, 199, 1910. In 1911, the third and final Binet Simo intelligence test is at last published. Binet is tired, very tired indeed. By now there are honors, recognition, acclaim from a hundred centers of learning. Despite his weariness, Binet insists on reading a paper before his own psychological child study society. It is tumultuously received. But the next day, when Dr. Simon calls... But surely, oh, he is up and dressed, Dr. Simon. And yet, such pallor. He... he doesn't look at all well, though he is in excellent spirits. Shh! He'll hear you. Is that you, Simon? Glad to see you up, Alfred. Yesterday's ovation must have done you good. Uh, I've forgotten it already. The completed task has never any appeal for me, Simon. Once I wrote a play with feverish excitement and then forgot to attend the opening. Madame Binet has never forgiven me for that. I'd bought a new gown for the occasion and waited hours. You were always a patient woman, my dear. But didn't you know that's why I married you? Oh, Alfred. But today, Simon, I shall have an excellent time. Then you must plan to be working. Working? I have planned a whole new series of investigations on the problem. I, I believe that, that I have it all outlined in my head. My head. Vinny. Alfred. Oh, no. We'd better call the concierge, Madame Vinny. I, I shall need help to get him to bed. What is it, Dr. Seymour? I fear it may be a cerebral hemorrhage. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Pray God I'm wrong. <laughs> Dr. Simo is not wrong. The genius of Alfred Binet is already lost to his friends, his family, his beloved science. Some weeks later, on October 18, 1911, he dies. His is a tragically early death. He is but 54 years old. Alfred Binet, the man, dies. But Alfred Binet, the scientist, lives on in observations, discoveries, methods, lives on in the extensions and revisions of his tests made by other men. The trackless wilderness of the human mind is no longer so much a mystery. Indeed, by 1917, paper and pencil tests have been developed, so that the individual testing of Binet is now broadened to include the testing of large groups of children and adults. The Army uses this method to the bewilderment of many a puzzled buck private in World War I. Man, I've seen everything now. I just took me a mental test. Army Alpha, that's what it's called. Army Alpha, the World War I group test for literate soldiers. How'd you do, Elmer? How you come out? Come out? Gosh, you're mighty, Sergeant. I know somebody's crazy. I hope it ain't me. Uh, what'd they ask you, kid? Riding, shooting, what's a corporal? Stuff like that? Birds. Birds? Birds is what I said. A regular professor hands me a piece of paper, and I fill in answers to what's wrote on it. The feathers on a bird's wings, it says, help him to fly because they make a wide light surface, keep the air off in his body, uh, keep the wings from cooling off too fast. Cross the square in front of the right answer. Professor? Sounds to me like an out-and-out -out idiot. That or a German spy. Now here's another one he asks us. Horses' feathers have all... Have all what? That's all. Horses' feathers have all. Turn it around so it makes a sentence and then say, is it true or false? All horses have feathers. Horse feathers. That's exactly what I wrote down. Never heard of such lunacy in my life. Then they give me numbers. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. What comes next? Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Let me see. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve... Adding them up, um, 42, I make it. 43 comes next. That just shows your ignorance. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. 16 comes next. Oh, 
That's the way they figure, huh? All that there goes in to make up what's called my IQ. And then a darn fool tries to make out I'm 15 years old. Told him plain to his face I'll be 26 my next birthday, November the 9th. Said his birthday or mine, I ask you. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. You don't know what you're liable to be, Sarge. You ain't been tested yet. <laughs> now, me, I've been tested. All I got to say is them professors better look out who they're calling a the moron. <laughs> No, neither the wise guy sergeant nor the rural private are morons. Neither are the first scientists to administer the famous army alpha. But the word moron, completely misunderstood, does come into everyday use. A moron is not necessarily a pervert or a criminal, though he as well as a person of retarded mental development whose intelligence never exceeds that of the average 12-year-old. From army tests, another misunderstanding also gains wide acceptance. You've heard it said frequently, too frequently. Oh, the public... After all, when you're dealing with the public, remember their intelligence is only that of a 13-year-old child. Uh, careful, madam. Careful. This is a scientist speaking now. You yourself, madam, aren't any more intelligent than you were when you were 16. But... Perhaps no more intelligent than at 13. But certainly my IQ is higher than that of a 13-year-old child. Not necessarily, madam. You may know more, but your IQ may not be any higher than that of a 2, 3, or 4-year-old. Well... I never heard of such nonsense. Perhaps I should explain. Uh, you'd better. The IQ measures the rate at which you can learn. Many people who know much less than you do may have a much greater ability to learn, knowing less only because of youth, isolation, or some other such factor. Um, could you explain it so as I understand it? I think so, son. How old are you? Oh, I'm ten. Very well. To find your IQ, or anybody else's, we give a test to find out how well you solve problems. Like telling the name of a president and that kind of stuff? No, 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 not facts so much as ability to think logically and understand relationships between words or objects. Oh, okay, I get you. Then what? Well, then we score the test, just as a teacher scores a test in school. We find out where your score stands in relation to other scores of other people at different ages. Whether I know as much as other kids ten years old. That's right. We find out which age group your thinking most resembles. Now, if your score as a 10-year-old was as high as the average 12-year-old, then your IQ would be 120, definitely superior. Gee, I'm pretty good, huh? But if your score was about the same as the average 8-year-old, then your IQ would be only 80, subnormal. Now, look here. What about the geniuses that flunk out of school and successful businessmen who never went to school? Well, school doesn't give anyone any intelligence. It only gives opportunity to use intelligence. Intelligence tests try to distinguish between native ability and acquired learning. We certainly cannot yet distinguish them definitely or precisely. And what's probably more important, we can't tell exactly why one person should be more intelligent than another. No, oh, then you don't know it all, eh? No, we do not know it all. And though science has learned much since Alfred Binet lived, worked, and died, we shall never know it all. Science makes only this modest claim to know a little more. Nor is the intelligence test the perfect tool, the final answer to the fascinating puzzle of the human personality. Yet it is an important tool. The grading of the human mind, the raw material with which education works, is and remains a challenge and a hope. To meet the challenge of our possibilities, to realize our hopes for a finer future in a fairer world, here human learning marches with humankind on the human adventure. Your science magazine of the air has presented another chapter from the human adventure titled The Measurement of Human Intelligence. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.